Welcome to part 7 of the American Revolution. Now we're going to take a look at the Battle of Saratoga. So 1775 saw the disaster outside of Quebec. 1776 saw Washington's army constantly being defeated, pushed out of New York and across all of New Jersey and into Pennsylvania. That was only punctuated by the successful Christmas Day raid on Trenton and a lesser known follow-up raid that took place on January 3rd at Princeton, right? And 1777 looks to be a pretty bleak year. The British have captured and controlled New York City. They're working their way towards uh, Philadelphia, and by September, they will have captured Philadelphia as well. Okay, Washington's army's holding on, but they're just doing that. They're just holding on. And the British are going to launch a planned series of attacks with the idea of isolating New England away from the rest of the colony. The belief being if that you can cut New England off from the rest of the colonies, those colonies uh, south of New England will fall into line. This plan is going to be executed by General John Burgoyne. Now, it's supposed to be a two-prong attack with Gentleman, John, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne coming from the north, retaking Montreal and moving south in New York and taking uh, the fortifications like Fort Ticonderoga and the other ones that had been taken by Arnold a couple years earlier, right? And General Howell was supposed to come from the south from New York City, okay? Now, John Burgoyne is going to fulfill his role coming from the north, but... As I mentioned before, General Howe has like this obsession with New York City. He is too concerned about putting New York City in danger by having his troops leave. Um, he leaves them there. He doesn't do the southern part of the advance, and it's going to ultimately cost him his job, right? Now, what John Burgoyne discovers as he moves his troops south and in, into the Hudson River Valley is that it's a logistical nightmare, right? His 10,000-strong force uh, is constantly out of supply, right? And um, by September of 1777, he began marching in June. By September, his force is down to only 6,000 6, men, and they're running out of supplies. And so as a result, they're going to have to heavily rely on foraging. Really what they're going to be doing is they're going to be raiding the local farms and stealing their food, right? That only serves as a recruitment poster for his opposition, which was led by a general named Horatio Gates, right? Now, Horatio Gates isn't necessarily a very competent general, but we'll get back to that later. Fortunately for Horatio Gates, he has a subordinate officer that is very competent, Benedict Arnold, right? So, Horatio Gates is going to execute a plan that was primarily the brainchild of Benedict Arnold in order to um, lure out uh, uh, John Burgoyne's forces and isolate and surround him. Meanwhile, as this is going on, his forces are slowly growing, and by the time we reach September, his forces have reached 15,000 men, right? Now, Burgoyne is going to decide to push towards Albany, New York, where he hopes to connect to Howell's forces pushing from the south, not knowing that Howell has not sent any troops north. And in two battles that take place in September and October of 1777, Benedict Arnold is instrumental in beating back Burgoyne's forces and surrounding them at a place called Saratoga. When Burgoyne is surrounded in Saratoga, he realizes that this situation is impossible. He's outnumbered almost three to one, right? And he stands a good chance of his uh, forces being absolutely annihilated. And so he surrenders. Now this is really, really important because 6,000 British troops surrendering here at Saratoga at that time was the largest single surrender of British forces in British history. Never before had so many British soldiers surrendered at once. This is huge. This is a major battlefield victory and a turning point of the war because as we'll talk about here in a moment, France is on the fence on whether or not they're going to support the colonists or not. Remember, that's one of the conditions of, of victory. That's one of the war objectives, get help. Well, you got to give them something to convince them that you can win this fight. Well, what better uh, selling point to say, hey, look, we have just orchestrated the largest single surrender of British troops in British history. And they'll ultimately later surpass, surpass that at Yorktown, but of course that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Now, Benedict Arnold is really the champion here, right? Uh, but unfortunately, um, Horatio Gates, when he writes up the report, he doesn't really like Benedict Arnold, and so he takes pretty much all the credit. 
And he kind of actually even slights Benedict Arnold in the in his report. And Benedict Arnold, who feels like he's he's very he's very uh, much an egomaniac, um, he finally really has enough in the in the Battle of Saratoga. He'd gotten rewounded in that same leg that got wounded in Quebec, and so he's going to have to convalesce. And ultimately, when Philadelphia, as I mentioned, which will be captured in September 1777, but it'll be abandoned by the following March. Um, by the British, he'll be made the military governor of Philadelphia, disgruntled, wounded, pride bruised, and there he's going to marry Peggy Shippen. Perry Shippen is the daughter of a suspected loyalist. Ultimately, by 1779, he's had it with the colonial cause, and he's stationed as the commander of West Point, and he's made the decision that he's going to hand West Point over to the British on a silver platter and he begins communicating with a British spy named Major John Andre. Unfortunately for him, though, in September of 1780, the spy, John Andre, will be captured by colonial forces, and in his possession will be papers that reveal Arnold's treason, including a paper that signed by General Arnold at this point that allows the spy, John Andre, to bypass all checkpoints without being searched. All right. Arnold gets wind of this, and he'll flee, and he'll get a minor commission in the British Army. He'll die in obscurity on June 14, 1801. But this is why today we remember Arnold for his treason, and Benedict Arnold is often a word, uh, a name that's uh, attributed to a traitor. But when we take a look at it, up to the, that point, at least up until Saratoga, had things gone different as far as way, the way he felt, or at least perceived, was treated by the, the colonists, he might be remembered as a great revolutionary hero, had just a few things gone differently. But as I said, Saratoga is a great military victory for the colonists, right? The largest ever surrender of British troops in history. Imagine what that did to the morale of the troops, right? Sky high. Recruitment skyrocketed after this, right? Uh, Howell, who had failed to fulfill his part of the bargain with his northern advance, also became very nervous about the danger to New York with uh, the defeat of Burgoyne's forces, and so he began reducing the troops in his just recently captured Philadelphia, right? He'd only captured it in, in September, and now he's already redu reducing the forces to fortify New York City. Like I said, Howell's got kind of a unhealthy obsession with this city, right? But finally, and most importantly, the victory here at the Battle of Saratoga is going to convince France that the colonial cause can succeed and is going to convince them to declare war on Great Britain. Benjamin Franklin is in Paris trying to negotiate with the French to get them to, to uh, side with the colonial cause, right? And imagine his joy when he got to tell them about this great victory at Saratoga, right? Finally, on February 6, 1778, France and the colonists will sign the Treaty of Alliance. And the Treaty of Alliance states that France will declare war uh, on Britain and remain at war with Britain until such time that Britain recognizes the independence of the colonies, right? And on the flip side of that, uh, if France's uh, um, government is ever in danger, the American colonies commit to supporting it as well. We're going to end up breaking that part of the treaty later on when the French Revolution begins, right? Um, when the uh, French reported to the British that they had signed this treaty uh, in March of 1778, Britain immediately responded by declaring war on France. So, you know, there we go. They didn't even have to do it. Britain took care of it for them. On March 17, 1778, Britain declares war on France. So now they've, they've got a revolution in their colonies and a war with France, right? Now, initially, that doesn't mean a whole lot. What do we get out of this initially? Well, there's some fighting in the Caribbean between uh, British and French, uh, mostly ships, right? Mostly a naval, naval battles taking place there. But it's just the beginning, right? France then begins to lean on its allies. It says, it goes to Spain, it says, Spain, we want you to declare war on Britain too. And of course, initially Spain's like, ah, I don't want to. I remember what happened in the Seven Years' War, and that didn't work out very good for us. But France convinces Spain, they tell them, say, look, if you do this, we promise you we're going to get you Florida back, right? Well, Spain wants Florida back. So in 1779, Spain joins the war, 
in support of France, not in support of the colonies. They don't care if they get their independence, but they do want to get Florida back. In fact, the governor of Louisiana, remember that's under Sp in Spanish hands right now, the governor of Louisiana, Bernardo de Galvez, will actually take an army and immediately lead it into West Florida and begin capturing um, cities held by the British, like Baton Rouge and Natchez and Mobile and then Pensacola, right? Kind of the one little unknown things about the American Revolution was that during that time, Spain is going to invade the British territory of Florida during the war, okay? Uh, they also kept the Mississippi River open to trade from uh, from Europe so that the uh, colonists can get supplies through that route, okay? So that's just the beginning. After that, they convinced Holland to declare war too. So the Netherlands declare war on Britain, okay? Britain's becoming more and more isolated. Those remaining European powers who were not directly allied with Britain, like Portugal and Hesse and Prussia, are all going to band together, and they're going to declare themselves in an alliance, a, a non-war alliance with Brit, with uh, against Britain. They're going to call themselves, I think this is a great name, the European League of Armed Neutrals. What a fantastic name. The European League of Armed Neutrals will not declare war against Great Britain, but they will declare an embargo on all British goods. So you can see Britain is becoming more and more isolated. And as a result of this, in Parliament, you start to see open resistance to the war, right? With British, the British being completely isolated. And also you're going to see Philadelphia completely abandoned by Howell. That was just kind of a matter of time, right? Um, okay, so remember the war objectives. Let's revisit that for a second. Number one, keep an army in the field. All right. The colonists are doing that. Washington is keeping his army from being defeated, sometimes by the hairiest edge, but he's pulling it off. Number two, get help. He just did, they just done this. They got France involved now. They're going to start, you're going to start to see supplies filter in and then eventually troops, right? And then the third one, break the British will to fight. You're starting to see that. You're seeing leaders in parliament like Adam Smith and Edmund Burke begin openly opposing the war. This is all the chemistry that was needed there in order for the colonists to ultimately end up victorious.